himself an experience which for him became language, but a language so luminous. Arena, T.S. Eliot, Saturday at 9.45 on BBC Two. Now on BBC One and also the BBC HD channel, a return to Aramage as British veterans honour the men they fought alongside 65 years ago on D-Day. Good afternoon and welcome to Aromange, normally a quiet town on the coast of northern France. But as you can see, there's a very different atmosphere here today because this town lies at the heart of events that mark the 65th anniversary of D-Day. If you've been following the news this week, you'll know that this is an anniversary that still has the power to generate a great deal of passion with all the controversy as to whether the Queen should be attending. But we can put all that debate behind us now because this afternoon we're here simply to honour the men who on June the 6th, 1944, landed along this stretch of coastline you can see behind me to seize Europe back from the five years of Nazi control. Today, many of the men who fought on D-Day and in the ferocious Battle of Normandy that followed have returned to share their memories with comrades and to honour their friends who can no longer be here. In just under 40 minutes, there'll be a service of remembrance attended by Gordon Brown and the French Prime Minister, François Fillon. It'll be held in the town square here, overlooking the beaches where so many men were lost. And while Aramanche is the focus for the British veterans, we'll also bring reports from other ceremonies. Early this afternoon at the American Cemetery in Colville-sur-Mer, Prince Charles, President Obama, Gordon Brown, Prime Minister Stephen Harper of Canada and President Sarkozy gathered together to remember those who fell. And all across the region, almost every town and village has found a way to honour and celebrate the day that marked the beginning of the liberation of France. That liberation began not by sea, but by air. And in a tribute to the men of the 6th Airborne Division, three para, recently back from Afghanistan, landed near the village of Ronville. And at the very first house to be liberated, the veterans were as warmly welcomed today as they were 65 years ago. And further along the coast at Colville Montgomery, renamed after the commander of the D-Day landings, General Montgomery, men who landed on Sword Beach and local residents gathered to remember. I was on Sword Beach on D-Day. It's very emotional uh, and uh, it seems like yesterday that we were here. My grandfather was a French soldier and we are certainly the, the last generation uh, who can tell something about, uh, about this part of history. Uh, it's very important for us. And as darkness fell last night, the skies above the invasion beaches were ablaze with fireworks. Well, I was watching those fireworks and they were an extraordinary sight. And all day today, the town has been filling with Normandy veterans in their 80s and 90s now, all displaying their medals. I've been chatting to a few of them and so many of them come here every year and they've made good friends here in Aramosh. There's a wonderful atmosphere down in the town square and to give us an insight into the extraordinary challenge that these men faced back in 1944, Dan Snow. It is a wonderful atmosphere, Fiona. Obviously, as soon as we went on there, it started raining. But anyway, Aramanche is the best place to come and talk about D-Day because it's really in the heart of the D-Day battlefield. A um, hundred miles that way is Portsmouth. And out there in the English Channel, the biggest concentration of naval power ever assembled, 7,000 ships made their way here towards five in beaches, invasion beaches with 130,000 men on board. And those five beaches over there to the east was Sword and Juno, Gold where I was, and of course uh, over there is Utah and next to us here on Sword, Omaha, where all those Americans lost their lives. Now those men as they came in on the invasion craft here 
They would have known that they had air cover, there had been paratroop drops, but they weren't taking anything sort of too easily because they had heard about Hitler's vast defensive belt that stretched from the Spanish border up to Norway, known as the Atlantic Wall. Now, I'm joined by one of those men now. Dom, you're actually on those uh, invasion craft. Uh, what was it like coming in that morning? It was absolutely terrific. I mean, we had, we were very scared and the weather was just like it is today with plenty of wind and stuff like that you know and uh, and we finally managed to get on the beaches um, where there was tremendous amount of bombing and aircraft and um, battleships firing over the top of us and it was horrific really I wouldn't want to go through it again no. yeah you say it's terrific but it must have been terrifying as well it was terrifying we had loads of casualties on the beach uh, I landed at Juneau and we had loads of Canadians that had already been killed in the assault and uh, we were supporting these Canadians and uh, as we came in uh, went up the beach there were snipers firing at us so it was really really terrific yeah re really frightening yeah Extraordinary to be back after all these years. So through the day, Fiona, I'll be talking to lots more of these men who attack these beaches as the uh, commemorations progress. Extraordinary to hear those first-hand accounts of just how horrifying it was. And in this afternoon's service of remembrance, for the first time, the Normandy veterans have invited cadets, aged from 12 to 19, from all over Great Britain, to march alongside them and to play a part in the ceremony. When it begins, here to provide the commentary will be James Nochty, who's becoming something of a D-Day regular himself, as he was here five years ago for the 60th anniversary. And the same scene, Fiona, is, is being laid out in the square in Aramanche here uh, with that wind and rain that Dan referred to, but nothing can dampen the spirits of these men and women and their families who've come to mark the 65th anniversary. And as you say, there was cadets coming to receive uh, almost physically a torch of remembrance from the veterans who want to make the point that this will never be forgotten and passed on to future generations. The service will take place with a drumhead altar which has been set up just by the museum here to the landings uh, a set of drums as it would be done on the battlefield with the standards on top an old military tradition a way of life in the battlefield and it emphasizes something of the nature of this occasion because it's not a formal uh, slickly choreographed affair uh, the timings may vary it isn't the cenotaph for Westminster Abbey it's a gathering that has something of a family reunion about it an intimacy that we're going to be privileged for a short time to, to share a feeling that's evident in this little town and all the villages along the coast where they still speak of the liberators and British American Canadian flags everywhere. Simon True, deputy head of the War Studies Department at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst is with me and Simon you know these beaches well and take uh, officers in training here. Um, the cadets of course are going to be a very touching feature of this ceremony because many of them in their teens are going to be the same age as the old boys here gathered for the service were on D-Day. That's right. I mean, some of the um, soldiers who fought here in the Normandy campaign of 1944 were in fact younger than some of the cadets that are here today. And um, one's reminded, for example, of Private Jack Banks, uh, a young man of 16 years old who lies buried in Jerusalem War Cemetery, just a few miles south of Bayeux. So some of the young men and, uh, who fought here in 1944 were very young indeed. And I mentioned the, the feeling here of it being um, a service and a gathering that has a rather special intimacy about it. The, the marching is always very touching because there are people here hitting 90 and beyond and it's, you know, it's quite a, it, it's quite a hard road to tread as watching them at the Montgomery Memorial yesterday and there they are marching but my goodness what an effort goes into it these days. That, that's right. I mean it's, a, it's a obviously a very proud occasion for the men who come here, as you say, in their 80s and their 90s. So uh, there was a chap on the uh, ferry that I was coming across on on Wednesday who said, I'm 91 and a third. A third <laughs> obviously counted too. And of course we have chestful of, uh, chestfuls of medals, uh, uh, men who carry with enormous pride these signals of their courage and their survival. It's all going to start here very soon. And as we said, events to mark this DD anniversary are taking place all across Normandy. Many of the veterans have already been to two services earlier today in Bayeux, just a few miles here from Aramanche. The first was arranged by the Royal British Legion. It was held in the cathedral that towers over the city and was attended by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, Gordon Brown and President Sarkozy. 
Then Prince Charles went on to the Bayeux War Cemetery, where he joined the Normandy, Normandy Veterans Association. And there, among the graves of the men who once fought to free Europe, they held a simple memorial service. They grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, we will remember them. After the service, Prince Charles met veterans. Have you had a good time here the last few days? Are you, they keep you going on Calvados. Come on, veterans! Three good chairs! Hip, 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 Wonderful. And the Normandy invasion required the close and unprecedented cooperation of armed forces from many different parts of the world. To honour the courage and the sacrifice of these men, world, ladder, world leaders gathered together this afternoon at the American cemetery set high on the cliffs above Omaha Beach, the site of course that was once the scene of an appalling battle where many thousands of American soldiers were killed or wounded in just a few hours. First to touch down was President Obama and his wife Michelle. Followed by President Sarkozy. Inside the cemetery, the two leaders were joined by Prince Charles, Gordon Brown, and the Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper. President Obama then spoke to the veterans. Friends and veterans, we cannot forget. What we must not forget is that D-Day was a time and a place where the bravery and selflessness of a few was able to change the course of an entire century. In an hour of maximum danger, amid the bleakest of circumstances, men who thought themselves ordinary found within themselves the ability to do something extraordinary. They fought for their moms and sweethearts back home, for the fellow warriors they came to know as brothers. And they fought out of a simple sense of duty, a duty sustained by the same ideals for which their countrymen had once fought and bled for over two centuries. To those men who achieved that victory 65 years ago, we thank you for your service. May God bless you, and may God bless the memory of all those who rest you. Ladies and gentlemen, four of the Normandy veterans who are with us here today will be awarded the Legion of Honor in recognition of their efforts and bravery. Jack Sidney Woods, au nom de la République française, nous vous faisons officier de la Légion d'honneur.
please rise for a 21-gun salute, the playing of taps, and a flyover by the French, British, and U.S. Air Forces. The service of remembrance that's about to take place here in Aramanche is very much a traditional part of the D-Day commemorations. In fact, many veterans have been making their way to Normandy for decades in order to honour their comrades who died here. We invited three of them to share their memories of D-Day and to explain why they feel they need to keep coming back year after year. Frank Rosier was just 18 when he set sail for France in a landing craft. All the way over the course of the rough sea, we were kept below deck, so there was roughly 300 of us on that boat. And on that time, nine out of ten of us were seasick. And with the smell of the engine oil, some of the blokes smoking, it was hell on earth. We um, actually hit the beach, and the idea was that there's 30 of you in a platoon, and you train together, you sleep together, you're brothers, you are a family. And the orders were, if one of you got hit, was to run on and leave him. And that's tape from doing. At 11.30 p.m. on the 5th of June, seaman Peter Thompson learnt that his destination was Normandy. About half past six in the morning, we landed off the coast of France. It was daylight then, and we'd look round and we could see thousands of ships landing class, absolutely thousands of them. You could almost step stone back to England on them. There were so many of them. And you could almost see the shells. There were 16 inch shells that were firing. And you could almost see them as they went straight across your head, you know. I was just a young kid. We went to war and, and I'd never been on an operation before. So it was really a shaking. And to see men run up the beach and got mowed down and shot down is, is re really traumatic to you. It really upsets you. It even upsets me now speaking about it because it is something you, you could never imagine happening. Ted Roberts landed on Gold Beach at mid-morning. We went straight off the beach into the fields and our first attack was through an open field and uh, because it was open, open country we was getting shot right, left and centre by snipers and, and what have you. And I think we lost about 70% of our battalion on the first attack. And then the ambulances used to arrive on the beach and we used to t take on about 500 badly wounded soldiers. And we used to almost convert to a hospital ship because we, we had four uh, surgeons on board and we had 24 medics on board. Uh, from out of this hedge, uh, a yard away, stepped this very young German soldier. Uh, they both went for our guns. Uh, I had a stand and he had a smizer across the back. And actually I killed him. And I sat on the grass and I was sick and bad and cried because I'd killed a human being. And I had two cracks. I knew someone was shooting at me. So, but the bullet came through my arm. So I just laid there and laid there. And all of a sudden you hear the rumble of tanks. You don't know if it's the Germans or if it's British tanks. I've never been frightened, so frightened in my life and I don't think I'll ever be frightened like that again. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. And I feel I was so lucky that I should go back and pay my respects to those poor devils who never came back. And nine out of ten of the lads will tell you they wear the medals for them that lay there. They never got to wear a medal and they never got to wear their cap badge again. And that's why we wear them in cemeteries in particular, for them.
Well, uh, the veterans are marching along and um, the locals, French people, Dutch, Brits all cheering them on. Arthur, these are great scenes, aren't they? I mean, oh, what, fantastic. You, you, you come back year after year. Why, why yeah. are you doing that? Out of respect for shipmates, comrades, what uh, are here now, I will never come back home. And you, you have to respect them. They, they give their ultimate silent, uh, sacrifice, you know, for this country and um, the people. And it's nice when people come up and say, in France here, well done, we thank you very much. But, but I imagine it would be quite painful coming back. I mean, this was the scene of, of devastation. Is that not the case? Yes, it was. Um, you get frightened and I think a little bit of fear keeps with you all your life. Because you remember things which normal people don't see and don't hear. And um, as I say, you get upset when you come back here, but then it wears off again while the next time and that kind of thing. Arthur, you better get in with your mates because uh, we're going to have to let you go. Fiona, back to you. Well, so far, we've heard from the men who invaded France by sea. But ahead of the main attack force, as we mentioned earlier, a small number of men landed by air in the early hours of June the 6th. Their mission? To capture the bridges over the River Orne and Caen Canal, and in doing so, protect the men on the beaches from a German counterattack. In a daring and dangerous operation, six gliders, each carrying 30 men of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, led the way. On board one of the gliders was a young Titch Rayner. We loaded up at 11 o'clock in Torrent Rushton in our gliders. We all wished each other the very best of luck. We all blacked our faces and uh, uh, got prepared to go. We knew we was going on to a very dangerous job. We all thought it was going to be a, a, a no return job. Surprise was critical, so the flimsy wooden canvas planes glided to their destination with only moonlight to guide them. My glider was number four and we was cast off at the wrong place and we landed eight miles from our target. So we actually took that bridge as well, so we took three bridges on that night. So it was a very successful operation. If we hadn't have taken those bridges, the Germans would have got the Sword Beach, also gone along and taken the Americans off. I feel very proud that I was in that operation. Also, to go back and pay homage to those great men, or say were the finest soldiers in the British Army. A remarkable man. And you know, Titch Rayner wasn't only at D-Day, he was also one of the last soldiers to leave Dunkirk, and he later went on to fight at the Battle of Arnhem. Well, the veterans are marching into the square now, as we saw just a moment ago. It's time to hand you over to James Nofty to lead us through the service of remembrance. And in the square, the veterans go to their places. They've been lining up to parade in the Somme Battlefield Pipe Band. Most of the pipers, incidentally, and the drummers are French. I think they've been filled out with a few uh, Scottish faces in there. But uh, by Jove, they play with enormous gusto and verve. And they're caught up in the whole emotion of this occasion. Following on um, a parade, really an informal parade, of all the veterans who are hanging around in the rain around the corner there. I think some of them were singing, why are we waiting? Well, they're not waiting any longer. They're happy with their friends. It's a curious atmosphere here because there was one side of it, which of course is marked by great solemnity. But there's also a huge amount of jollity, because as we heard from some of the veterans there talking to Dan, there is that sense of comradeship renewed. And even the awful memories which they carry from these beaches, these fields, and the campaign that led them into Normandy can be not set aside, but balanced by the comradeship. Simon True from Sandhurst, who's with me, uh, knows that well. And it's the most striking aspect of this gathering, isn't it, Simon? That's right. It's a real mixture of, of celebration and commemoration, moments of solemnity alongside moments of celebration. And uh, it's great to see the, the veterans, in particular, in the hours leading up to these uh, ceremonies, getting together in the bars and the streets and talking to the young cadets and other civilians walking around. So it's a real sharing experience. 
experience, I think. And we can see the wonderful uh, richness of the military traditions that are represented here. I mean, these uh, pipers who commemorate what happened on the, on the Somme. But as you look around the cap badges, the wonderful arrays of medals, the, the berries set at exactly the right angle, the odd white feather, a splash of tartan. You see the whole history, really, of the British Army and the other services represented in this square and microcosm. That's right. I mean, there are, there are obviously representatives of all three main arms of service. There have been plenty of people here from the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force, as well as from the Army. And uh, the invasion, of course, on D-Day was very much a tri-service and indeed a multinational effort. The flags, of course, hanging here above the museum um, show not just the flags of the United Kingdom, but also Canada and Poland and the Czech Republic and so forth, all of whom contributed. And indeed, we've uh, looking earlier around uh, the square today, there have been people from every nation, not just from the United Kingdom here. And you know, you can see and feel what a band does. Here's the band of the King's Division, which will be playing an important part in today's service, joining the Somme Battlefield Pipe Band. Fortunately, they're not playing at the same time, and that might produce a, a rather awkward oral collision. But the minute a military band strikes up, watching them yesterday at Monty's Memorial, just down the coast there, the way that it energized the veterans who were there, many in wheelchairs, many pretty and firm, many wondering if they'll ever come to these beaches again. Somehow there was a spring in their step, the back straightened as they heard this music. Yes, I mean, it, it, it's very energising for them. And you can see as they march into the, uh, into the square just how, how much they're enjoying it, in fact, that this is a really serious moment of commemoration for them, but it's also a time, as I say, to celebrate. Slightly miserable day, but my goodness, they've been having fun. And there was dancing going on uh, in the square here late into the night, sort of wartime songs of Vera Lynn everywhere, and uh, everybody swapping um, stories over Normandy cider as well. We heard the Prince of Wales earlier mentioning Calvados that keeps them going, I think was a bit of that washing around. And, of course, they're never far from their memories here because they're marching now only a few yards from the very beach, at the edge of Gold Beach, where many of them landed and the story that they're passing on to these young cadets, hundreds of them who've joined the perhaps 600 veterans who are here in, in, in this area to really learn what happened here. And it's a very conscious attempt to show some sign of the message being passed on as the numbers of veterans diminishes uh, as the years go by. And these cadets, they're from 12 to 19 from schools all across the country are here and uh, talking to them is a very moving experience because they've been spending time with old soldiers who've been telling them uh, what it was like. Often, I have to say, with tears in their eyes because, Simon, you know this well as someone steeped in military history and the life of training officers that the pride in heroism and the joy of comradeship is always balanced with an understanding of the horror of war and what happened in these beaches. One doesn't cancel out the other, they're two sides of the same coin. That's right, I mean the, the, the men who came here of course were fighting for a a great and a noble cause. It was perhaps a, a genuinely good war that was fought. But of course they were also, you know, tied together by small unit cohesion essentially. On D-Day and in the months afterwards they're fighting for their mates. They're fighting for the men immediately around them. This is what really ties them together rather than great democratic principles, for example. And it's so moving to hear them talk, as we did a moment ago, about the desire to wear medals for those who never came home. They're joined now by the various VIPs who've come on from these ceremonies which have been taking place throughout the region this morning. The Prime Minister Gordon Brown, the subject of a lot of talk this week, uh, but here away from politics for two or three hours, uh, meeting these veterans. Uh, he'll be saying a few words uh, with the French Prime Minister, whom we expect to speak in English a little later. Uh, Mr. Brown's been with President Obama, President Sarkozy, as we've heard, uh, Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister of Canada, along the coast there above Omaha Beach. And he'll be uh, participating in this ceremony. He's talking now to uh, retired Major General Tony Richardson, who's the president of the Normandy Veterans Association. And one of the curiosities, Simon, a rather touching one about the Normandy Veterans Association, which is organizing this commemoration, is that it didn't come into being until the 1980s when they realized that they wanted to do something to keep the memory alive. 
That's right. I mean, uh, veterans have always come back to Normandy ever since the end of the Second World War, and they will always continue coming back, I'm sure. But really, it is in the early 1980s when the Normandy Veterans Association was first organised that um, the kind of thing that we're seeing today really got into full swing. Uh, the early ceremonies, for example, of the 40th anniversary were, were well attended. Uh, but I, I think back to 1994, I was privileged enough to be here in 1994, and there were 4,000 British veterans parading actually on the beach itself then. Um, of course, one of the things that's happened in the last uh, 15 or 10 years or so is, is that you know, the more senior officers have tended to, to pass away. So what we're left with really now tend to be men who were in their early 20s in the campaign itself, uh, private soldiers, non-commissioned officers and junior officers, but the lieutenant colonels, the brigadiers, the generals are, are now all gone. And many of them the same age as the young cadets that are standing there, uh, some of them talking to the Prime Minister and Sarah Brown, who are now among them taking their places on the day as the drumhead altar, as I mentioned, which is going to be the focus of the religious service that will take place. Um, how it will unfold, I have to say, is slightly uncertain because um, these things move at a, a slightly uh, statelier pace than you would get if you have young soldiers zipping along. Um, at Monty's statue yesterday, it was terribly moving to see the soldiers clustering round their old general's uh, figure, uh, this, the statue, uh, their quavering voices joining in a hymn, uh, moving very slowly, another band of French pipers. Uh, all the timings went awry, the fi fly past uh, was bang on time and it came really before they were ready, but despite the solemnity, uh, nobody uh, really let the relaxed friendship go. It was there and the bustle and noise in this square isn't at all reverential. There's a great deal of fun. And this is a small town, a village really, a holiday place, the sort of place where Monsieur Hulot might have come on holiday, wouldn't have enjoyed weather like this, um, but it's you know full of bucket and spade shops and a lovely ice cream shop just down on the front there, and that is very much the spirit of it. But of course, you can't go far without seeing the museum there, which um, marks the, the landings, the debarkement, because they all always use the word landing in France and never talk about an invasion because yes, this was the liberation. It's the word you hear everywhere here. It's not a word that's used with any any embarrassment or any care. It is the natural word, isn't it, Simon? That's, that's right. I mean, obviously, um, it, it's a difficult experience for, for many of the French when they, um, when they see this. They, they wish to celebrate the liberation of France from Nazi occupation but of course there was an, a colossal price to be paid by the uh, by the civilian population of, of Normandy the better part of 14,000 uh, French civilians were killed during the Normandy campaign and although cities like Bayeux for example or Aramanche itself were, were liberated with relatively little damage other places like Caen were pretty much flattened uh, so, you know, right across Normandy, uh, many Frenchmen are, are actually remembering the damage that was caused, I suspect, as well. Worth remembering that that Battle of Normandy took, what, six weeks and more before they, they broke through in August of 1944, and the fighting all the way from here through Caen and Bayeux and then west, uh, eastward, rather, towards Paris was very fierce. That, that, that's right. I mean, of, of course, today this is the anniversary of, of D-Day itself. But it's tremendously important to, to realise that although D-Day was a tremendous success, um, perhaps even more of a success than the Allies hoped it might be in some senses, especially the, uh, the number of casualties, which was rather fewer than anticipated, you know, it was merely the beginning. And quite rapidly, the campaign bogged down in the hedgerows and the fields of Normandy. Caen, which should have been captured on the first day, wasn't captured until over a month after D-Day. And of course, during that period, many thousands of young men were killed or wounded or psychologically traumatised. Uh, what were the casualties on the German side? I mean, on the Allied side, it was, what, a quarter of a million by the time the Battle yes, of Normandy was over? That, that's right. I mean, <laughs> bizarrely, you might think, it's, it's actually quite difficult to be certain of the number of casualties. Many people, of course, were missing. Some were taken prisoner. Some, their bodies were never found or have only been found in recent years. Uh, it's, it's pretty much estimated that on both sides, the casualties during the Normandy campaign were well over 200,000. In fact, pretty much around 210,000 for for both sides. So um, uh, the Americans bore the weight of the, uh, of the Allied casualties, perhaps about 120, 130,000 of those, but 85,000 or so British and Canadian soldiers uh, either died or were wounded or were taken prisoner in some cases during the campaign. And the truth is that every one of these veterans here has many, many friends who never went home. 
Well, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, we tend to think of uh, some of the problems on D-Day, especially places like Omaha Beach, but just a mile up the coast from, from here, the village of Le Hamel, 1st Battalion of the Hampshires landed there in the assault wave at, uh, at Gold Beach, and they lost over two, or no, almost 200 evening, men on D-Day. And in particular, officer casualties were particularly high. Some of the battalions, if you look at, um, at the casualties sustained, 1st Dorsets, who also landed on uh, Gold Beach, they lost 42% of their officers in the first two days of the invasion. They're uh, getting their marching orders, so to speak, now. Just things are beginning to be organised. The, most of them have come into the square now. I can see some veterans still heading down the umbrellas. Sadly, up someone was making the rather poignant point that uh, the weather on D-Day was rather like this, Simon. Was it? Is this sort of, the sort <laughs> yes. of day it was? Actually, th this is very reminiscent also of a 1994 commemoration. That in 2004 was, uh, was beautifully sunny, but uh, the weather's unfortunately turned a little against us the, this afternoon. It was beautiful and sunny this morning. But yes, the, um, the weather conditions on the morning of the D-Day were, were pretty marginal, in fact. Uh, much worse than that, and they might have had to call off the invasion. The invasion was, in fact, delayed by a day in order to well, avoid the worst consequences of the storms. We're looking out to see, and we can see the hulks of the Mulberry Harbours, those uh, prefabricated harbours that were brought all the way 100 miles from the south coast of England and lie there almost like submarines that are coming out from under the waves. As the tide goes back, a couple of them are revealed. And there's a landing craft down there, a few jeeps around. It is a most touching sight. And it is not only for the veterans, but for the young who are here. As we've said, the cadets are going to play a significant part in this service. We talked to some of them to get a better understanding of what D-Day may mean to their generation. I'm really interested in going to Normandy this year because the veterans will be passing over the mantle of remembrance to the cadets will be remembering all those who fought in D-Day in June 1944 with the veterans this year and hopefully we'll be able to continue that in the future. I'd like to actually see where the action took place and everything because these men, these are brave men that you know, were trained to fight against all this enemy. They don't know what was ahead of them and what was coming at them. Well, my granddad was in Normandy in 1944 and I've got his kit bag and his diary. Within the diary he tells a story that he was in a truck going down the road and there was a small German camp. Unfortunately they went down the wrong road where the Germans were and they ended up getting into small arms fire. You know, some shots were fired and some grenades were thrown. Um, that's what my granddad wrote in his diary. I'm going to go to Normandy to meet the veterans so they could tell me themselves what happened and what they saw and hopefully I'll be able to pass down what they told me to other people so they won't forget what happened or they won't forget the veterans. I'm looking forward to going to the Normandy celebration to show how grateful I am to the soldiers who died. When you have the first-hand experience being in the place where it happened and speaking to the real people who were there at the time, it brings the history to life and it means a lot more. We should remember it because the second we start remembering is the second we start forgetting and we'll just forget about all those men who were killed there to save our country. These cadets have been talking uh, with great um, intensity and I think great gentleness to some of the veterans here who've been trying to explain to them that which is really inexplicable, what it felt like to be on a beach being being shot at, being bombarded, seeing your comrades lying dead around you and coming off these ships in the most awful conditions. You can look out to that sea now and it looks pretty benign, but coming in on a landing craft was a hellish experience for so many of them. The stage is set here now. The VIPs are in their places, the Band of the King's Division, in their red uniforms and gleaming helmets is ready to play. The cadets are lined up. The veterans are in their places. The standard of the Normandy Veterans Association is flying and people are finding all sorts of ways of protecting themselves from the rain that's sort of sprinkling down but not causing too much difficulty. of the Queen has just been uh, put up on the big screen and is causing veterans to cheer and acknowledge uh, her virtual presence. Prince of Wales of course has been 
doing his duty today at uh, various services, the Normandy Veterans Association, one at the cemetery earlier, and the Royal British Legion service at uh, Bayeux Cathedral. And overhead, from this grey sky, comes a fly-past. There, emerging from the gloom, is a Lancaster bomber and two Spitfires, and Maryland engines crackling away. One of them, Simon True, that did service on D-Day itself. That's right, yes. Um, the Spitfires were tremendously important, providing um, air cover. Of course, the German Luftwaffe in the West still some sort of threat, and uh, very important that the troops getting ashore should not be exposed to the not-so-tender attentions of the Luftwaffe. The other Spitfire um, in the flight as well was here on D plus one, and indeed participated in the shooting down of a German fighter on that day. They wheel around out to sea and they'll come back and uh, it is a most touching sight and sound. When they came over the trees at uh, Colville Montgomery yesterday, every eye turned to the heavens and uh, I think some of those eyes were rather moist when they had passed. They bring back such memories. The pilot of the Lancaster squadron leader Stuart Reid, who's been in the RAF for about 30 years. The Spitfires are being flown by squadron leader Al Pinner and Flight Lieutenant Anthony Parkinson. A proud moment for them as they wheel back across, coming from the north, over Aramanche. The veterans and the cadets burst into applause as a French tricolor greets them on the coast of a place where they once did such extraordinary things. And Lancaster itself actually was built just after D-Day, it was in 1945, and it's one, I think, Simon, of only two that uh, are around. Yes, that's right, there's another in Canada, but I'm sure, I think you're absolutely right, you know, the veterans here will remember with a great deal of, uh, of gratitude the um, close air support that was provided by the Royal Air Force um, and indeed the United States Army Air Force during 1944 during the campaign. And now the planes have left us and Dennis Buston, the master of ceremonies for this commemoration, is at the lectern. The service is about to begin. Many of the veterans, including the chaplain to the NVA, taking pictures they were trying to capture those planes as they went across but a rather more solemn atmosphere now descends as the, Fr the French Prime Minister Francois Fillon, uh, President Sarkozy's Prime Minister greets Sarah and Gordon Brown and takes his place on the platform as the planes make one more pass heading above us eastwards and disappearing into the mist with every eye in Adam People say to me that they, uh, as they disappear. can't help but having a tear in their eye when they hear the sound of those engines. And I can well believe it, if you've been stuck on the beaches, you would have loved the sound of those engines. Um, I'm delighted to say that uh, our French Prime Minister has now come, Monsieur Fillon, and thank you very much, sir, for coming. Um, thank you for the Normandy weather. <laughs> Um, but uh, you're very welcome to, to be with us tonight and uh, we appreciate your presence. Now I'm going to pass uh, the lecture over to our national chaplain uh, to lead our service. Okay. Let us remember before God all who took part in the Normandy landings, those who gave their lives as comrades in the British Army, the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, and from other countries whom we remember with pride. And we pray that loyal to their example and their sense of duty, we may ever be vigilant of freedom, peace, and security. We say together the Lord's Prayer. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We sing the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. I think so. The lesson is taken from the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, beginning at the first verse. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, 
a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Thank you. We now come to the laying of reeds and I'd like to invite the English Prime Minister and the French Prime Minister to lay reeds together uh, at the stone here. Gordon Brown and Francois Fillon, the French Prime Minister, moved together to lay a wreath at the Aramanche plaque, which reads simply, the key of the liberation of Europe. The place where the events of 1944 and the end of the Second World War, a year later, in Europe, began. Gustav Holst, Tony Sorry, Richardson, the yeah, president of the National the, of the uh, Normandy Veterans Association and its chairman, but the mayor of Aramanche lay there wreaths accompanied by Peter Thompson memory. from the Surrey branch of the Normandy Veterans, who's an honoured citizen of Aramanche, and uh, it's a wonderful relationship which Surrey branch have with this town. And one by one being identified from the and, uh, dais. The last they come with their tributes. are laid by the Chief of the General Staff, the General Officer Commanding 3rd Division, and Admiral Cooling. Thank you, gentlemen. In this simple square, these plaques are a permanent memory of what happened here, so that anyone coming here, and many, many do in the course of a year, can see what is being commemorated here on the 6th of June D-Day itself. General Sir Richard Danner, Chief of the General Staff, is one of those laying a wreath with Major General Barney White Spunner, whom we heard reading from Ecclesiastes a moment ago, and the Assistant Chief of Naval Staff, Rear Admiral Robert G. Cooling. These plaques commemorating many of those who weren't in the front line of battle, but who played an absolutely vital role in protecting so many lives and supporting those who went on ahead. And as these proceedings continue with the band of the King's Division, and after that, first hymn, the great Welsh tune, Blanwern, you can sense here a, a settling of an atmosphere which these people who've come here have, have sought. They know that this is a moment when they can create special memories that will not fade. And many of them may wonder how often they will make it here again. one by one. They lay their tokens of remembrance and no doubt for each of the men here and their families there's a particular thought that they have in mind. And of course D-Day was not just a military occasion there was a great civil uh, input into this, civilian input 
and uh, we have a representative of the civil engineers who designed and supervised the manufacture of the Mulberry Harbour that we see still standing out there that was only supposed to last, supposed to last a few days, but is still there. And so I'd like to ask Ken Dalton, uh, representing those civil engineers, if he would like to lay his wreath. The wreaths, the build-up, and the reference there to those uh, parts of the Mulberry Harbour that sit there out in the grey sea, protecting these beaches. It was, Simon was saying earlier, the size of Dover Harbour, that Mulberry. How many ships could get in there? Well, I mean, it could accommodate even transatlantic liberty ships, you know, 10,000 tonnes of displacement in addition to sort of literally hundreds of, of small craft. And, of course, the Mulberry Harbour is designed to give protection against the, the worst of the effects of the Channel weather, which can be unpredictable at the best of times. Um, what we see now is, of course, just some components of it. Much of it has disappeared, but it's quite remarkable. Um, the comment that this was only supposed to last a short time is absolutely true and yet still 65 years later we can see the remnants and when the tide is low here it, it seems to come out and go in very very quickly I mean these yes. shallow sands when the tide retreats there's a wonderful view of pieces of them that lie there anywhere else they would I suppose be ugly hulks but they carry such memories and are redolent of so much history to his sure keeping those who have died for their country in war those whom we knew and whose memory we treasure and all who have lived and died in the service of mankind they went with songs to the battle they were young straight of limb true of eye steady and aglow they were staunch to the end against odds uncounted, they fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old, that we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the year condemn. And the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We, we will, will remember, remember them. them. Percy Lewis.
Ravalli played by Corporal Andrew Bormont. The standards are raised once more. Let us pray. Almighty God, the Father of all men, we pray this day for all the nations of the world that laying aside all unworthy ambition and mistaken fear, they may understand and follow the things that belong to your peace. May the whole body of mankind, healed of its divisions, be united in the service of all that is good and true. We pray especially this day for the people of this land of France, of Great Britain, and of all allied countries, that as we stood together in the dark days of the war, we may find a common cause in the days ahead, united in the service of all that is honorable and true, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and merciful Father, we pray for all those who have suffered because of war, those who still carry the grievous scars of battle, whether in body or mind, those who were bereaved and who have never lost the deep ache of separation, and all whose faith in you was shaken by war, leaving them confused and bitter. Grant to all who are still in great need your gifts of healing, light and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We shall sing the hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. The Navy Hymn.
O God, we give thanks to thee this day in our prayers. We give thanks with our presence on this day, in which we are gathered here to honour those who died in the Battle of Normandy. Let us say together the prayer of the Normandy Veterans Association. O oh, eternal Lord God, who has united together all veterans of the Normandy campaign, grant we beseech you your blessing and give us strength to carry on our work to aid and bring companionship to all Normandy veterans and joy and common purpose throughout our association. We, we ask this in the name of, of Jesus Christ, Christ whose courage never failed. Amen. Amen. Together. Lord, Lord God our Father, we pledge ourselves to serve thee and mankind in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of thy name. Guide us by thy Spirit, give us wisdom, give us hope, and keep us faithful now and always. Amen. The Veterans Pledge. You may have gathered that we've had uh, a lot of cadets, 500 cadets and 100 of their officers with us for the last couple of days, and it's been a great joy to have them here. And I know they have loved meeting the veterans and hearing their stories. And they're here to learn what you did 65 years ago and to promise to remember what you did. And so we're going to ask a veteran, George Batts, to charge a cadet to remember what you did and to pass it on to future generations. You have heard and seen the sights of June 1944 and of the bravery and sacrifice of so many of our friends. These events made the future and life which you have enjoyed. Please always remember these things and tell the story as often as you can. And now a cadet will respond, Helena Schofield. I appreciate what you and your friends did for us and I promise never to forget your bravery and sacrifices. Helena is in the Portsmouth Combined Cadet Force, part of the Air Training Corps. She's 17 years old. And we must now return the national standard, so if the standard bearer can come forward to receive the standard. Thank you very much. ceremonial involving the standards which are so important to these old soldiers and sailors and airmen represents so much to them Arthur Tarr collects the standard he was in the Royal Navy part of a crew engaged in the first wave ashore at half past six in the morning 65 years ago on Omaha Beach just to the west of us here where he helped to land Sherman tanks for the American forces in the main as they came and ashore. now we sing the French national anthem. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us pray. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. I'd like on your behalf to thank our national chaplain, Ken Ward, for being with us. Um, and uh, he's utterly determined to be with us. And it's a great joy to see him here. And I thank you, Ken, very much for being with us. Ken Ward was on a minesweeper on D-Day with the Royal Navy, just off Gold Beach, which is beside us here. Your order of service now has the title, Greetings. But because of the weather, I think we're going to have to abbreviate these dramatically. Hooray, said somebody, who's obviously very wet out there. I'll tell you roughly what they were. The first was a 60 second video clip with a message from Viscount Montgomery, the son of Monty, who recorded a family message. There he is there. Maybe we can cut that off. There we are, we've cut it off. But. <laughs> Nobody could we ever cut Monty of off. Lord could they? there on the big but, screen, uh, because of the weather, that screen's really not very visible there. to most of the people he in the square, huddling under their umbrellas. All, saying he's sorry he couldn't be with you. He's been with you on many occasions out here, but uh, advancing years. Um, and we were expecting in a moment you, three sets of remarks. The first from General Sir Richard Dannett, who's Chief of the General Staff, in his last year Winston in that post. Followed Winston by the two Prime Ministers who are with us today, our own, Gordon Brown, who will make some remarks, um, and also François Fillon, the Prime Minister of France, whom we expect to speak in English. Where his grandfather had planned the great battles of the Second World War. And uh, he similarly wished to be remembered to everyone. And also, he was very insistent. These that greetings the remind us uh, of the intimacy the of this occasion. As I, I say, I think there are five or six hundred veterans who've made the trip this year. And, the third and so many of them know each other. So many of them are familiar visits, visitors to these places. They know the sight of a landing craft that I can see sailing past in the grey sea beyond. They represent all the veterans who are in the 77 branches of the Normandy Veterans Association across the country, dedicated to looking after those old soldiers, sailors and airmen, who have had difficulties with the advancing years and who need assistance and who value the comradeship as the years take their toll. I will read you a couple of words from an obituary of a flight lieutenant who died just a couple of weeks ago. And he said a, a welcome interlude was provided when Vera Lynn arrived at the squadron's forward airstrip, close to the Japanese positions, and serenaded the pilots from the wing of a Spitfire. That girl sang her heart out, bless her. Well, you'd have thought Vera Lynn was here, actually. Her voice was echoing around the square last night into the early hours. And um, there are... Um, some quite elderly people here who seem to me to have fair old stamina. When I got back from Pegasus Bridge, which must have been about one o'clock this morning after the fireworks and the excitement up there and the moving commemoration, uh, the square was still awash with jollity and dancing. I won't say everybody who was 90 was dancing, but they were having a jolly good time. Swapping the old stories, which they've no doubt told many, many times. But which don't fade but with the I'm years. I'm going to invite the Chief of General Staff now to say a very few words to you all as the current soldier uh, and what he learned from D-Day. General Sir Richard Dannett. Prime Ministers, uh, National President, ladies and gentlemen, veterans. As we commemorate today the courage and sacrifice of the brave soldiers of the Allied powers 65 years ago, I know that I speak on behalf of all soldiers of all over the world when I salute the focus, determination and professionalism of all of you 
and your comrades who stormed into northern France from the air and from the sea in June 1944. The awe and respect in which the veterans of Normandy are held by the soldiers of today is that when it comes down to it, the nature of frontline combat has changed very little in the last 65 years. To a soldier today fighting in the upper Sangin Valley in southern Afghanistan, the nature of the battle he is fighting, like that fought on these very beaches, is frequently reduced to whether he's better trained, better led, and has more guts and determination than the man in his sights, or even the man at the other end of his bayonet. But while soldiers today can share the feelings of what you experienced in 1944, it's the scale, duration, and sheer ferocity of what you faced as you slogged your way from Normandy to Germany that for our generation fortunately dwarfs our current military commitments. And it is this which commands the admiration of those of us in uniform today. Your example is an inspiration, a true inspiration for the armed forces of today. We as soldiers are humbled by your courage and professionalism in the face of warfare of an unimaginable scale and intensity to us. We are truly grateful for the experiences that in many ways still influence the way that we do things today. And we are honoured to wear the uniform and maintain the identity and ideals of those who gave so much here on these beaches. And we will never forget that. God bless you for what you did 65 years ago and for the inspiration that you give us today. We salute you. General Sir Richard Dannett, who salutes the veterans and who will be followed by the Prime Minister. Thank you, General, for those words, uh, and I'm sure they are appreciated by the veterans. I'd now like to invite uh, our Prime Minister to say a few brief words to you. I am here to praise men of courage and men of bravery. Let me first of all congratulate the Normandy Veterans Association. Let me thank you for all you have done over the years to represent those who have fought in the Battle of Normandy and make the case to government after government. Let me thank the cadets who are here today and all those who represent our armed forces they serve our country at every stage with distinction and valour, and we are extremely proud of the best armed forces in the world. Let me say to the Pre Prime Minister of France that we are grateful that you are here with us today. The relationships between our two countries are stronger than ever and will be strengthened in the years to come. But let me most of all praise the veterans of Normandy. You made it possible for Europe to be free. Your actions made possible the breakthrough to victory. By coming here and by taking the chances that you did and making the sacrifices you did, there is a direct line from here and the action you took to Berlin and the fall of the Third Reich, to the liberation of Europe and to the creation of a free world. And we are permanently in your debt and in your gratitude, we are grateful for everything you do. Field Marshal Montgomery spoke to the troops just before the battles of 1944. And he asked the troops then, what's the most important thing you have? And some of the members of the forces said it was their equipment and their planes and their tanks and all the different things that they had that they brought with them. And Field Marshal Montgomery said to them, said no, the most important thing you have is you. And the most important thing we have had, the most important thing our country has had, is you, your service, your inspiration, your continuing dedication to the patriotism of this country, your sacrifices. And let us remember those who died. As long as history books will be written, they will never be forgotten. Let us remember your courage, your professionalism, it will be remembered forever from the British people 
to the veterans of Normandy, my thanks for your courage, your professionalism, and your patriotism. Prime Minister, there was a little unrest when he stood up, and some people feel that the Thank arrangements you, for Minister. guests weren't made well, and, but uh, feel all passed off Minister quietly would like to in say the a end. Few words also. Thank you. Francois Fillon, the Prime Minister of France, follows Gordon Brown. Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, France has forgotten nothing. France will never forget the decisive events which came to pass in these places. After five years of bloody battles, five years during which the flame of hope was protected by the immense courage of the British people, on the 6th of June 1944, those fighting for freedom engaged all their forces against barbarity. This time, the challenge is not to fight to survive, but to fight to win the final victory. With, the, with these words, King George VI announced the D-Day landings to his people. With the word, la bataille suprême est engagée, the ultimate battle has begun, General de Gaulle informed the French people. At that very moment, in the waters of Gold Beach, on Juno Beach, on Sword Beach, British and Commonwealth units advance onto the French soil whilst Americans fight on Omaha Beach. In a few hours, amid this incredible outburst of force, thousands of lives were changed forever. Promising young lives were shattered in blockhouses. Heroes emerged. Heroes, those who charged forward under fire. Heroes, those who held firm under the roar of exploding shells. Heroes, those who kept fighting, not because they loved war, but because they wanted freedom. Today, in the silence, the grass sways in the wind over the sand dunes, the villages and roads of Normandy bask peacefully in the light of spring and rain. But time doesn't diminish our debt to those who sacrificed their lives to free us from barbarity. Time cannot change the sacred pact that exists between our two nations. Together, we know the price of freedom and peace. Under European soil rest those who succumbed to the incessant wars and persecution that ravage our continent. We have built a peaceful Europe and we are the guardian of this treasure. We shall never surrender, vowed Winston Churchill. France always remember what she owes to you. The Prime Minister of France, François Fillon. Thank you, Prime Minister, for those words which we, I'm sure, appreciate very much. We now come to that wonderful part of Normandy Veteran Events, Land of Hope and Glory. So let's all sing loudly, Land of Hope and Glory, so that they can hear it back in England over there without having to listen or watch the television. So let's have Land of Hope and Glory, please, sung with full verve and vigour, which I know you can do. Thank you very much.
the standard of the Normandy Veterans Association. It's going to be lowered just at the corner of the square, the 6th of June square in Aramosh. Washed with a little rain, topped with grey skies. The seas of the channel quietly receding on the low flat beaches. Sunset and the lowering of the standard, the end of a soldier's day. <laughs> Veterans care for their flag. Fred Lee and Peter Thompson, two members of the NVA, take it and protect it. They're joined by Cadet Sergeant Major Lee Ord from Aberdeen, who lowered that standard. He's only 17 from the 2nd Battalion Highlanders, part of the Army Cadet Force. And here's retired Major General Tony Richardson, the President of the NBA. First, the standard is presented. And now we're going to conclude our time together as we always do in this square by singing Old Lang Syne. And I'm going to insist that all the VIPs go down into the square <laughs> and join with you. Now they've got no choice after that, have they? Land of hope and glory. And Prime Minister uh, and Sarah Brown join the crowd with so General the Sir Richard Dannett and band, uh, Francois Fillon, Lisa, the French Prime you Minister. Very much. Prime Minister with a smile on his face despite the week he's had at home and the things that, that lie ahead in the turbulent political waters into which he'll sail when he returns later tonight. Once again the Somme Battlefield Pipe Band join the proceedings as they've been doing day and night here for some days emerging from little corners and alleyways with some wonderful sounds. And gradually the tune they all know is picked up and the Prime Minister finds himself with Sir Richard Dannett in the midst of some old soldiers. Most of these pipers are French, as I was saying earlier. 